find out how it all started. How did you become an actress at a very young age? Well, I started modeling children's clothes when I was like three or four. And my older sister was an acrobat, and she used to go around to various, you know, veterans' hospitals and things, and she would perform, and I would sort of tag along. So I had this one, it was in Long Beach, California, and Jock Mahoney was there. And you remember him, he was the Range Rider and the MC Derringer, and he was this big cowboy. Well, anyway, I had an agent. My mother got me an agent when I was young doing, you know, modeling for children's clothes. But every time I'd go on an audition, you know, to read for a part, I'd never get the part because I didn't have any experience. And it's kind of like a catch-22. You know, they don't give you a part unless you've done something. And how do you do something right. unless they give you the part? So, it, you know, it's, it's kind of rough. So, at any rate, I met Jock Mahoney at this, um, this benefit. It was for the veterans. And he was this big, handsome cowboy. And, um, I was just mesmerized by him, and so he um, had me come up on stage, and I sang a little song called I'm a Big Girl Now. Well, about six months later, I happened to be on another audition. I'd been on countless auditions and never got anything. So I'm in the lobby, and they give you what's called the size, which is just, you know, the scene of, well, some of you probably already know that, but um, it's the scene of what you're going to be in rather than giving you the whole script. And um, in the script, it said, sitting in the lobby is little Walda Kowalski with her big brown eyes and her long brown hair. Well, I have blue eyes, and I was always a blonde. Now it's gray, but uh, don't tell it. <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, as fate would have it, Jock Mahoney happened to be walking through the lobby, and he was under contract. So he had a bit of clout. So he asked my mother what I was doing there. And my mother said, well, she's reading for this part of a little girl, but she's probably not right for it because, you know, they're looking for a little girl with big brown eyes and long brown hair, which really had nothing to do with the storyline, but sometimes the writer will envision, you know, what they're looking for, but it wasn't really pertinent or anything. So he said, I'll be right back. And what we found out later is that he went in to the producer and he said, oh, this kid's done this and she's done that. I had not done a thing. And so basically, he lied, and um, <laughs> they took his word for it, and um, they, they gave me the part, and it was with dialogue, and it was called The Killer That Stopped New York with Edlin Keyes. And um, so after that, you know, I had that kind of, you know, a credit under my belt, so to speak, and so the next time I went on an audition, it was for a movie with Bing Crosby and Jane Wyman called Here Comes the Groom. And so I could say that I had just done the speaking role. And so I did that, and then it just kind of segued. I was very blessed because I just kind of went from, you know, show to show. I did The Greatest Show on Earth with um, Jimmy Stewart. I was the little girl in the audience where he comes up and, um, you know, starts talking to me and gives me a balloon. And, you know, looking back, um, Cecil B. DeMille was the director, but I was so young. I had no idea who Cecil B. DeMille was, and I didn't know that the clown was Jimmy Stewart because I was too young. <coughs> so really, it wasn't until I became an adult that I realized how blessed I was to have been directed by Cecil B. DeMille, and then I did Shane, which was directed by George Stevens, and Here Comes the Groom was directed by Frank Capra, but I, I had no concept. I, I had no idea. And so now I look back and I just feel so grateful that I had that opportunity. So many great projects. Um, I'm going to throw it out to the audience in just a minute, but I wanted to uh, ask you about Lou Costello. Oh. So uh, can you have some memories of Lou? Because a, a, a lot of monster bashers are big fans of Lou Costello. Oh, he was wonderful. I was a big fan, of course, of Abbott and Costello. So uh, when I went on the audition to read, it was for an episode of Wagon Train. And it was the only dramatic role that he ever did. And it shows you kind of like how the world has changed because the storyline back then, it was about, he was a drifter and he was an alcoholic and I was an orphan and I was traveling with him. Well, these days you couldn't have a show with a little girl traveling with an alcoholic. It would be totally inappropriate, you know? But back then it was, 
you know, it was back in the 50s and people didn't even think about it twice. It was just a very sweet story. Well, anyway, I was very excited to get to meet him because I was a big Abbott and Costello fan. And he was so dear. He was the nicest man. And it was such an honor to work with him. And I'm so grateful because in one of the books about him, he did a quote and he was talking about that episode. And he thanked me and said there was a little girl and I couldn't have done it without her. She <laughs> was so sweet. And um, yeah, he gave me an autographed picture and um, said, of course, I have it home. And um, he was just a dear man. And um, I, I just feel so lucky to have worked with him. Okay, let's let's open it up to some questions for Beverly Washburn, right here. So I uh, recently <laughs> come across uh, Spider Baby, and in this movie, and, and maybe go look at the uh, some images of you on the internet, and you have a, a very salty look at times. You know, you know, from <laughs> But I was curious, why in the episode of Deadly Years did they take all that 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 appeal that you have from that episode? Oh, and have, I had that real short. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how that happened. Um, I actually I was born a blonde, so my whole life I was blonde, and um, I was getting ready to do a film. This is just before Star Trek, and it was called Pit Stop, which was um, directed by the same director who directed Spider Baby and wrote it. And oh, somebody saw that movie. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, Dick Davalos and I were playing opposite each other, and he and I had the same color hair. So um, this was a movie with Brian Donlevy and Ellen Burstyn, although at the time uh, she went by the name of Ellen McRae. She wasn't famous yet, but it was actually, you know, later she changed her name. So at any rate, um, Dick Davalos, oh, and Sid Haig is in that too, who was also in Spider Man. <laughs> Terrific. Anyway, so um, they asked me, because we're playing opposite each other, Jack Hill said, I think it would look better if you didn't have the same color hair. You know, just that you should be opposite. Would you mind if we dyed your hair? So I said, no, that would, that would be fine. So they sent me to the salon in Beverly Hills to dye my hair. Well, this is, you know, 100 years ago. So they didn't have the products like they have now. So they dyed my hair, and it all fell out. It's like all, <laughs> like, well not all, but most of it, like coming out in clumps. So they had no, no other choice than to just cut it all off. So then after that, um, shortly after that, I, I went to read for Star Trek, and so I had that really short hair, and that's how I ended up with that hair. All right, more questions for Beverly. The back with the mustache. The episode of the thriller that is shown, uh, Bill Fry was a producer. I believe he was married to Elizabeth Montgomery. Um, how was he get along with this producer? You know, I, I, it always people say that I sound redundant because I always say everybody's so nice. But on, honestly, I was so fortunate to have worked with so many nice people, and I never really had any unpleasant experiences. He was nice. Everybody was just so nice to me, you know, I don't know why, but I feel just grateful that they all were, so he was he was wonderful, and of course Jeanette Nolan, who played the grandmother, she was just amazing. John McIntyre. Well. Yes, yes. Uh, that was a Bill Fry that was married to, uh, was it on the film, maybe so, William, uh, Asher. Asher. Asher, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, the, anyway, the whole cast and crew and everybody, and then of course, uh, Boris Karloff was not in that episode, but it was really a thrill to be on the set and you know sit in that uh, that room and have him introduce each of us. So meeting him was really a thrill. Well, James Grant was great to work with. I understand he was related to Deborah Patchett. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I, he, to me, he, he seemed to cross between Dean Van Cleef and Zachary Scott. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Oh. Yeah, very nice. Okay, more quite right up front, Michael. Uh, you work with so many extraordinary people. I was just wondering whose natural talent impressed you that you know, that's special to you, either as an actor or a director. Um, well, you know, as I said, I was so fortunate to work with so many wonderful people. I think if I 
I mean, it would be hard to pick, you know, one in particular, but I think if I had to, I'd have to say the two people in my career that I was closest to was Loretta Young and Jack Benny. And Loretta Young was like a second mother, and um, she was so genuine and just so <coughs> gifted and so talented and beautiful, and she was so hands-on. I did several of her episodic shows, you know, it started out being called Letters to Loretta, and the reason is because it was based on actual letters that fans would write into her, and then this, uh, the screenwriters would take the fan letters and turn it into a story, but then that kind of, you know, dissolved, and then it just went to being called the Loretta Young Show, and then years later, it, uh, she did a series called The New Loretta Young Show, and um, she called me at home and said, I'm going to play a widow with seven children, and I want you to be one of my daughters. And I was so honored. It was a short-lived series. In fact, Sandy Desher, right. who we talked about, a wonderful girl, and um, she and I played sisters in that. And Dirk and Dak Rambo were the twins, and Loretta Young discovered them. They were from uh, early Mark, California, and just the sweetest, dearest guys. Their real names were Orman and Norman. And so they changed it to Dirk and Dak, and sadly, Dirk was uh, killed in an automobile accident, a um, horrible accident. And uh, Dak went on to do a lot of TV. He was on The Sons of Will Sonnet, he was on Dallas, and they were the dearest guys in the world. And, um, but anyway, she would invite us over to her house for dinner, and she was very hands-on. She was in the makeup room and in the wardrobe room and in the hairdressing, and you know, and she would um, give us little tips and pointers. And um, she was just uh, one of the most beautiful, wonderful. I'll tell you a quick story if we have time. Um, I stayed in touch with her my whole life, and um, shortly before she died, my husband got cancer, and. Um, we had her, he passed away, but um, she was so dear to me, and she would call me about once a week and ask me how my husband was doing, and one time I went to the mailbox, and there was this beautiful little book on angels, and another time I went, and there was this beautiful little crystal dove that she sent me, and she was just so warm and wonderful. Well, anyway, she never liked to be called Loretta, and she didn't want to be called Miss Young, and when I first met her, she was married to Tom Lewis. So we were all instructed to call her Mrs. Lewis. Well, then years later, she married John Louis, the, um, you know, the fashion designer. So she liked to be called Mrs. Louis. So anyway, this one Sunday, we usually talk, you know, once a week. I, <laughs> I talked to her and I said, you know, Mrs. Louis, you're so beautiful, and you're such a legend, and people love you so much. And I'm just wondering if you would ever consider working again, you know, doing another film, because people love you so much. And she said, you know, honey, she said, I get scripts submitted to me on a daily basis, but she said, they're just not kind of, the kind of stories that I like to do, you know, they're just, it's a changed world, and all the stories, there's too much sex and violence, and it's just, not my kind of thing. And I said, yeah, I, I understand. And she took a breath and she said, besides, I'm too old, I'm too tired, and I'm too rich. <laughs> it's so funny. I never forgot that. All right, more questions for uh, Beverly. Okay, Dan. Wonderful, you know that film. Um, it was done in like you know we filmed it. I think it was 13 days, and the budget was like eleven dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when I went to read for that part, I was so I just wanted this part so badly because well, first of all, I'd never done such a crazy role, you know, and like we kill people. And um, but, um, but mainly that you know to work with Lon Chaney was my, you know, my thrill, and, and so um, when I got that part, it was just amazing. Now, 
when they offered him the, the role in the beginning, they couldn't afford to pay his salary because it was such a low budget film. And so he turned it down. Well, then they decided they'd offer it to um, um, uh, David Carradine. Is it David Carradine? John, John Carradine, Carradine. sorry. Uh, he, they offered it to John Carradine. Well, when he found out that they offered it to him, he changed his mind because he really wanted that part. So um, anyway, it was wonderful working with him. It was a known fact that he was an alcoholic. It wasn't a secret, but it never interfered. And so, you know, every afternoon he'd have to go to his trailer and have a little, you know, drink, just because he, otherwise he'd get the shakes. But it never interfered. And I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, but there's a, a scene on the porch where his eyes well up with tears. Well, in the movie business, if if a person, if an actor has to cry and they can't bring the tears, there's two things they do. Fortunately, for, I mean, I cry at supermarket openings, so I, 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 it's just always been easy for me to cry, so I haven't had to do, do that. But um, they either blow something in your eyes, it's, it must be horrible, like it's some menthol thing or whatever it is, they blow it in your eyes to make your eyes well up with tears, or if they want tears coming down, they take an eyedropper of something, it's like a glycerin or something that, you know, photographs his tears and they'll put it in, you know, the corner and then the tears come down. That's what they do if an actor can't cry. Well, anyway, he was supposed to cry in that scene and they asked him if he wanted that and he said, I don't think I need it. So they did this, this scene and those tears, those were real. He was so into that role, he wanted that role so badly. And the sad thing is, you know, after the movie came out, it just came and went. Nothing ever, you know, happened. And years go by, and sadly, Lon Chaney died before he could see that, you know, now it has this big cult following, and it has its own website and everything. And sadly, Jill Banner, who, who played um, my sister, who was wonderful, she, you probably know, was killed in an automobile accident. And so she also never got to see it. Because it sat around for like 35 years, and then Quentin Tarantino is a friend of Jack Hill's. And so he was very instrumental in getting it re-released. And because um, there was some kind of a copyright on it, or so, I don't know the whole story, but anyway, he he took it somewhere and had it re-digitalized or whatever they do, because <laughs> it was pretty grainy, you know, the first time. And and now it's it's so well received, and you know they've got spider baby shirts and you know all kind of things. And you can probably find those in the dealer room. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just it's such a campy little crazy movie. And some of you might have been at at this one particular. I can't remember if it was here or it was somewhere. We were talking about Spider Baby. And so they invited Jack, Jack Hill, and I were the only two that were at that particular convention representing Spider Baby. So they invited us up to this room because they wanted to do a little, um, like a interview that they could put on a podcast or I don't know what it was for. But anyway, so they're talking to us and the moderator turns to Jack and he says, you know, Jack, he said, I have to ask you about this film because it's such a quirky little crazy kind of off the wall, you know, it's kind of campy, it's just like really out there. And I'm just curious, like, how did that come about? Like, how would you sit down and write something like that? And Jack, who's, you know, he's in his 80s and he's very quiet and soft-spoken, he goes, well, I was smoking a lot of weed back then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, more, more questions for Beverly. Yeah. Scott? Uh, on the subject of Spider Baby, uh, the actress Carol Bomar is going to be in the cover. Uh, so about well, you know, she was quite big back in the day, and they were thrilled to get her to do it. And uh, they did like a Spider Baby reunion um, not too, well, it was a couple years ago, and Quentin Tarantino was there and everything, and Quinn Redeker, who played Uncle Peter. And um, they could not find her. They don't know if she's alive or if I've tried to find her too. Yeah, they, it looks like she disappeared, but they don't know if she's, you know, passed away or anything. But she was fun. You know, 
you know, sadly, it was done so quickly, you know, and most films like Old Yeller and, you know, those films, you know, you work for three months, but, you know, that one was 13 days. So we bonded as closely as we could for such a short, you know, um, filming time, but, um, but she was a lot of fun to work with. She was great. Yeah, I believe she was in House on Hill. Yeah, she did a lot of stuff, and I, it, I don't know why they can't find her. Okay, back here on the right. I did become a massage therapist for a while, but um, no, you know, I, I think it's that old saying about, you know, once you're bitten by the acting bug, it's kind of in your blood. If you, you know, of course, not for everybody. Some people, I guess, try it and don't like it, but it's something I've always liked to do. I took on a couple little odd jobs, but I really was never very good at anything. Oh. And so, but I loved acting, and um, so um, I'm still doing it. I just. I uh, narrated two documentaries recently, and um, still they're trying to get the funding for uh, a movie to be done with Tony Dow, Wally, from um, David Spieber and I. He, in fact, he wrote the foreword for my book. He's, he's the sweetest guy. Oh, tell us about your book. Uh, well, my book is called Real Tears, and it's spelled R-E-E-L. It's kind of like a little play on words because back in the day, of course now everything's on a, you know, digital, but back then it was actually, you know, done on a film reel, and then because of the fact that I was kind of, I don't know, every part I got pretty much, <clears throat> I had to cry, and they were all real tears, so it, it, you know, they came up with that title, Real Tears, and um, so it's in my autobiography, and it tells all about the people that I worked with, and there's a lot of, um, you know, stills from different shows that I, I was in, and it's my whole life up, up until now. And, and you'll have some copies here I at Monster Bash? I do have a few copies. Okay, yeah. great. We'll be opening up at 3 o'clock where you can talk to Beverly a lot more uh, and get her book as well. One more final question. We have one more here for Beverly. I thought there was someone in the front here. Oh, okay, Ken? And what role would you want us Um, well, you know, I think what role people mostly uh, remember me for is probably Old Yeller because it was probably <coughs> the most well known and I loved doing that film. It, it was just such a joy, you know, um, to be working on the Disney lot and it was at the time of the, the days of the old Mickey Mouse Club and so um, uh, one of my very best friends is Sharon Baird. It was one of the original Mouseketeer. She lives in Reno, but we get together a couple of times a year. She comes to visit me. I live in Las Vegas, or I go visit her. And, um, and Tommy Kirk, who, um, you know, as you all know, shot Old Yeller, um, he lives in Las Vegas. And so we get together periodically, and um, I make him dinner and stuff, because he's a bachelor, and he loves home cook meals. So. He comes over, and I was telling um, Mark and Bernie, my wonderful drivers, um, a story that happened one time. I was doing a panel, and we were talking about Old Yeller, and I happened to mention that Tommy, um, uh, Tommy and I are still friends, and I have him over for dinner and everything. And just then, this little girl is in the, you know, in the front row in the audience, and she goes, "Can I ask you something?" And I said, "Sure, honey. What is it?" And she goes, "Well, that." That boy that you're talking about, well, d he, he's the one that shot Old Yeller, right? <laughs> and I said, yes. And she goes, well, how could you still be friends with him? <laughs> Thank you. Well, we are so thankful to have Beverly Washburn here. And she mentioned one of our drivers. Mark is here with something from Monster Bash for you, Beverly. Aww. Beverly Washburn at Monster Bash.
program, and I feel so blessed to be invited back. And please come by my table. You don't have to buy anything if you don't want, but just come and say hello. And but so you know, I do donate um, part of my whatever I make on books, and I, I donate it to my favorite animal charity. So. Oh.